Okay, Josh, you want to take it away? People can put their names there. Josh, I can't hear you if you're talking. Good point. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, I can. Thank okay. you. Awesome. Um, did you already start? The, yes, you already started the recording. As the usual standing reminder, we have the action item list. Please take a look and see if there's any items that uh, are on your list that you have either done but not checked off or haven't done already. And then let's head right into the pending proposals. We have uh, Lang Team 86, which is a lot of the value. Maybe I just want to briefly talk about tomorrow's meeting. Uh, we normally have a plan where we do have a planning meeting on the calendar. I didn't send out any requests for updates. I don't know um, because I didn't forgot to do it. Uh, I don't have a good setup for that yet. I don't know if we have um, how many design meeting proposals, but I know at least uh, uh, at least one generators that we deferred. Um, do we want to have a, maybe a four? So one option, which Mark floated that I thought was kind of appealing, is we could have a foreshortened planning meeting to pick our design meetings and maybe uh, do one meeting that is a request for updates and just do the updates in their own meeting. How people feel about that? Because I don't want to, I'd rather give people some time to write updates than try to get it all by tomorrow. We do need to get into the habit of asking for updates on a uh, longer cadence before we actually need those updates ready, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to have a script that just sort of I can run just I found someone to write the script for me, but I need to tell them uh, what it should do. So hopefully that will happen soon. In any Maybe case, we uh, start a topic in uh, the appropriate Zulip for each project, asking for status updates on a date basis. Yeah. Anyway, we could go into that later. But does that sound like a good plan for the picking the design meetings? Sounds fine to me. Okay. All right, Josh, carry on. All right. So uh, I don't think there's any activity on uh, Lang Team 86 uh, eager drop. So that still oh, requires a write up. It's blocked on me. Not a problem. Or whoever uh, wants to. But. The const UB RFC 3016 is. Yeah. Uh, I'm merging it. I'm, I'm in the process of making a PR to merge it. I said okay, a circle awesome. with Ralph about something. Yeah. Sounds great. So then on to P high issues on wrestling rust. So there is, I think we could rather than go through them one by one, discuss them in mass. Cause I, I have, cause they're kind of, I don't know how much it's worth. Seem to have a similar disposition. Yes. They're somewhat different, but they're all sort of semi block on me of various kinds. So, uh, somewhat different in that they've made varying amounts of progress. Uh, but the question is, I don't really know what the question is. How, how much to prioritize closing these issues and how to think about them? I think there's a larger question of how to think about our soundness issues. I have would like to see us doing a drive to get them down to zero, but it's been hard to motivate that as a actually doing that work. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of opening it to the floor, I guess, to see what people have to say about these, any or all of these issues. But especially these last two seem pretty tied to some longstanding problems we've had around um, the handling of higher rank trade balance and so forth that I had hoped to fit, close out with by, by work on chalk, but you know, maybe we wanna prioritize that, I don't know. Is there a, any plausible way to spread around the effort here? Uh, like with the other, like can the, can the chalk contributors help at all with some of the things here? Or is that not reasonable? Potentially. Yeah, it's something okay. I'm wondering Nico, about. Nico, can you clarify, are you asking like, is it worth sort of prioritizing these for a short term fix with the existing like trade trade solving semantics or or should we wait for quote unquote, like wait for chalk or something? Is, is that the question you're trying to get? really sure what I'm asking. 
okay. I, I, I realized as I started talking, I didn't 100% know. But yeah, that's one question I'm asking, I guess. Uh, slash, if folks have a sense for how urgent kind of overall soundness issues are in terms of any particular reason. <laughs> like, there, there seems to be a number of kinds of risk, reputation risk, actual risk. Uh, as far as I know, we haven't really ever hit like any CVEs or things as a result of a soundness issue, but I'm not dying to have the first one. Um, I mean, we've had CVEs, but usually they were more like incorrect unsafe code or something like that, as far as I know. Uh, but yeah. Um, I guess another question would be whether anyone uh, sort of to, to Felix's point, what's the best way to distribute some of this effort? Is there people who are particularly interested in learning more about this area? Uh, in this group, I think the trades working group is a plausible place to start drumming up support, but it, you know, we have existing stuff we're working on, like GATS and Ampletrate. Um, some of which is entangled. My hope had been to close, especially these HRTB related things through progress on chalk, but also like the, the GAT improvements and other stuff we're doing sort of around that area and beefing up the way we handle these higher, more advanced logical constructs to be more correct. And I still want to do that, but I'm, I guess I'm wondering- Do you, do yeah, you how have much a sense, Nico, uh, of whether the sort of fixes in this area, like if, if you know, a partial fix is likely to result in breakage for actually sound code um, that currently compiles. And so it's sort of like, if we want a more complete solution, you know, we need to invest a lot of time, um, but a partial fix is also going to break people that, you know, are, are not actually doing anything wrong. Um, it's almost certainly true. I guess it's a question of scale. Right. Maybe, no maybe, maybe the right answer is to invest at least enough time to determine if there does seem to be a simple partial fix that we can assess uh, for each of them. That probably makes sense. I'm then think about longer term things slightly that down the line. We, we, this might be going into the weeds about details with respect to this meeting, but. Do you have metrics anywhere in terms of where chalk stands just in terms of feature parity with the existing trait system, like swapping it in? Like, Yeah, we do. I don't have, know them off the top of my head. Uh, we have like in preliminary integration and, you know, we can say what percentage of the test suite passes, for example. But um, it's still a fair distance. I wouldn't want to block urgent things on chalk landing, but... Uh, I think the other thing that I'm not sure about when I look at these issues is I would like to have a way to assess, like these are these are on this list because they're recently uncovered. <laughs> that doesn't make them higher priority necessarily, right? Uh, than the older issues we knew about and have, if anything, they maybe are, like it's hard to say, but maybe the older issues have been around longer. Uh, right. Right, a more, a more like general survey might be in order at some point. I would like to have a better way of prioritizing. Yeah. I don't know. I think, I guess we can move. I don't, I don't no, have any but, useful updates for this meeting and I don't know what our conclusion action item is except that I can try to review the recently opened ones and see um, and try to coordinate some action in trades working group area. That sort of makes well, sense. But backing up a slight step, uh, we kind of veered into there are lots of ways chalk could potentially help with this, but uh, I think we might have gotten slightly derailed from the question of is there any way people can help you so that these are not all blocked on you, Nico? Well, they can read the issues <laughs> and uh, dig into them and make offer some suggestions. I'm not sure, yeah, what else to offer there. Do we need to like go try to find more type theorists to pull into uh, Rust compiler development? Plausibly, I think this was what motivated the traits working group discussion because that's sort of like a good vector for those sorts of people. So it, it, 
I mean, one answer might be to try to do an initiative of this kind of like, okay, let's do a soundness push. But that is something that's been on my mind, but I think I put it off for now because it didn't seem like top priority. Uh, but I think that is the kind of thing we might do is to build up a stronger set of people in that area. I do think that is one of our notable gaps where we have one person on the team who primarily looks at those and you have a lot of other things going on. So I do think it would be a good idea for us to try to find more people who can help in that area. Yeah, this is, you know, when we were talking about link team organization, this is also one of the, like if we were gonna form sub teams that are more topic driven, the first one on my mind was, was probably traits and type system. Seems like an obvious, we have sort of some structure there and it's got a good clean division. Hmm. Okay. We could also poll for people currently in other teams who might have the requisite expertise to help. Right. I mean, that's what that would be part of it too, is there's an existing community of folks. Right. I think I will. Okay. I'm going to try to start a converse start to make a short list of people and get some action because i around this at least around these four issues and maybe broader start a rolling effort i, I know you wanted to address all issues on mass but since the, the specific issue of the the first one the fn out is valid type run size types that's an issue that has two different prs one that you've offered one that esteban wrote like uh, what do you see as the way to resolve the question of which of those to land if either Actually, that, that's one where maybe we could do is if somebody wanted to take 30 minutes to do a meeting with me <laughs> to rubber duck and talk it out, I would probably appreciate it. All right. I, I can do that. There you go. Well, okay. maybe not today, but as you know. No, no, but... not today, but yeah, later. <laughs> All right. I would be right. interested in joining that if only to try to get more expertise uh, on what kinds of things go into a discussion like that. So I'd love to just listen. All right. Yeah, that's actually probably another active thing we could do is just schedule some time to work on them. <laughs> that's what I've been doing for some of the other issues. It's pretty effective. Okay, let's start with that. Let's close them out one by one. All right, then let's go ahead on to the next set of items. And uh, in the meantime, you can schedule that meeting asynchronously. Okay. I didn't take so we have a uh, tracking issue for 2345, allow panicking and constants. This is Rust 51999. There are some unchecked action items. Don't yeah, know if people did like them or not. There is some review to be done. Oh, do we need to start looking for the word all in addition to our own names? Um, <laughs> 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 okay yeah I, I i wasn't sure I'm, I'm happy for feedback on that point uh but it you know the alternative is creating like five action items and i don't know which is better <laughs> well i think it depends if we actually want every person to review it individually then i think we do need an action item for each person if the thing is like a number of people need to build consensus on this then fcp works pretty well for that already so the only reason to add additional action items would be if we uh, feel like we need to avoid diffusion of responsibility. Yeah, I mean, I like it because it means I can check my name off and track whether I did it or not. But in this case, I didn't do it. So I don't know. I think all is probably OK. But people do need to scan for it. Yeah. I. I, I... Yeah, I don't know. I think the main thing here was that, at least for me, it was, it felt like the uh, sort of reason for the action item was less so that everyone should do it and more so like, if one person does it, then we can move to FCP or, you know, raise concerns. <laughs> right. Actually, I think that would be a good question to uh, ask here is, has anybody looked at the stabilization report well enough to feel that this should be put into FCP and then evaluated via the FCP? I have not. I would love to if someone would volunteer to do so. A specific person. 
we have a link to the stabilization report? Sure, I'll drop one in the thing. Oh, there it is. OK. Okay, so I can I can uh, read that and propose SCP if that would help. Awesome, thank you, Scott. Okay, next up we have range from patterns eight three nine one eight. We uh, have a stabilization write up already at this point, and so same kind of thing someone needs to decide that that write-up is sufficient to propose uh oh and in I think fact scott just did, did five minutes ago yes awesome so then that one doesn't need any further action in this meeting we just uh need to review and check boxes asynchronously next up 84701 stabilized member constraints. Looks like Nico, you're planning on reviewing an FCP. Well, I wrote the stabilization report, so I shouldn't really review it, I suppose. Uh, That's a good enough reason to uh, propose FCP in any case, but right. do you want to give us a quick uh, overview here? Yeah, I can summarize. It's a bit of a grungy detail issue, but it come this this is a feature, this is a feature gate we introduced when we were adding async fn, it um, it doesn't feature gate any usable any user visible feature in some sense. It feature gates an extension to the region inference algorithm that allowed us to handle uh, functions that return. Let me copy and paste the example. Um, allowed us to handle cases like this where the infiltrate names two different regions which aren't related to one another. Like there's no subset or superset relationship. We used to require that there was some subset or superset relationship. Um, and we needed that for async FN. And just out of caution, I put a feature gate so that it only affected async FN. It's, sta it's been stable for async FN ever since async FN was stabilized. Uh, I'm not aware of any real issues that have come up as a result of it. Um, I don't think it's, I don't really see any reason not to stabilize in the sense that like it, there are some potential complications with other language features, but they're inherent in the design of the language and not something that like are caused by making the uh, inference engine smarter. The particular complication I'm referring to has to do with um, uh, infiltrate when used in let position. And basically what it comes down to is our current region inferencer has is not particularly smart and would have uh, some trouble solving the constraints that arise. But that is, like I said, kind of inherent to um, the, input, the idea of having infiltrate in that position and not like something that says, oh, because we added this feature, we now have that problem. We'll just have it either way. It's just like, uh yeah makes sense uh one quick confirmation based on skimming the stabilization report and uh there's a specific reason i'm asking about this the syntax that you wrote for our member of tick a or tick b is meta syntax talking about the internals of the resolver and uh That's not right. okay yeah, it's not rust syntax in any way Right. I wonder sometimes if we should have some manner of easy syntactic convention for uh, this is actual Rust syntax versus this is non-Rust meta syntax describing internals. Just yeah, that would probably be clarifying. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what that should be, but I think that would, well, I would, it would like yeah, I'm thinking now about the idea of the more we have, I would like to have this some of these semantics like documented uh, and then we could reference them and that might make it easier also. 
because we wouldn't sense. be making up syntax on the fly every time. Uh, is this something that would show up somewhere in uh, mirror meta syntax? No. Like, would it, it be represented there? No. Okay, never mind. Then. I have right. a silly question, if you don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. This might be a terminology confusion on my part, but when every region must be equal to A or B, is that like, is there anything invariant related to the equals there, or is it must be at least as long as either A or B? No, it's invariant. It has to literally be A or B. Okay, cool. I guess it, no, it's just invariant. <laughs> I was gonna say, I I'm guess I'm not sure I've thought through why, but why that matters, but. Yeah, well, one way to think about it is if you, if you think of infiltrate as shorthand, for uh, for this type alias, right? You want something that you could actually type here that you can actually substitute in for those right type, and those region variables. You would, yeah, you would be able to reference tick a, tick b, or tick static, but not some superset of tick a, tick b, or tick static. Cool. Uh, answer to your question, Josh, yes, that's why I'm doing it. it. I should give that a little context. The plan, I'm working towards the stabilization of async functions and traits, and one of the stepping stones is named impl traits or a subset of them, uh, which we call slice zero, um, which avoids some of the inference limitations that where the behavior from the of the compiler deviates from the behavior of the RFCs, um, and this is one of the things on the list of stuff to cross out in order to get that work done. Awesome. Is there a roadmap issue somewhere that talks about the steps towards uh, async fun in trait? There is. Hold on a second. Um, With this presumably being one of the steps along the way. I'm about to put it here. There's a project board. Um, so I, at some point need to do more of an advanced write up, but that's probably the best source right now. There are also some HackMDs and other planning we've been doing. Um, yeah, that would have been part of a project update, <laughs> but. Awesome. Thanks for the clarification on the positioning of this. That makes a lot more sense now. And you're planning to propose FCP for that uh, after this meeting? Yeah. Sounds good. OK, let's uh, move on to the next item. We have one thing I'll briefly say about that project board. It's an un it's a Nico style project board, which means it's not something where a single item moves from left to right, but more like these are the milestones and these are the things blocking those milestones. <laughs> uh, in case you're accustomed to Kanban or something, it's not that. Um, Makes sense. So this is more a uh, two level bullet list where the first level is columns. Yes, I find that more helpful. <laughs> whatever works. OK, uh, anything else before we go on to 84039? Nope. OK, we have a proposal to uplift the invalid atomic ordering lint from Clippy to RustC. Uh, for context, we have previously requested that uh, individual uplifts from Clippy to uh, the language should come one at a time so that we can get an explanation and justification for each one. So this seems to be following that process. And there's a fairly specific lint here that makes sense. Yeah, the lint, I think, particular flags, like if you say the, the, or, the wrong ordering constant for a particular operation. Um, yeah. This is one of those ones where I would love to just delegate lints about use of standard library functions to libs and say, great. 
yeah, it's fine in this case. This one, I always personally wished we could have made a hard error somehow, since like in practice, these are almost always inline constants. This is reasonably close, I guess, but. But, but yes, I, uh, in case that wasn't clear, I'm totally in favor of this one. I think honestly, Agreed. if we want to one day make it a harder error, then we would uh, want to start with a lint and then we can ratchet that lint upward over time. Yep. Oh, sure. Because to be clear, actually triggering any code that would this lint's on like triggers a panic, right? So. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Let's do it. Meta thing. I would love to have like some sort of attributes that could be applied that the linter could look at to allow people to write this kind of lint with attributes so that we didn't need a hundred of them. If this was just a some some language feature for this this condition must hold for this parameter or something, that would be amazing. In theory we might get that like to some extent for free with like if we had these functions as const defend, um, like you could imagine that the compiler would like partially evaluate them and be able to detect the panic. Or some it version of seem... them variant types, right? Like yeah, yeah. I was thinking two things. First, that it seems related to the uh, operands for SIMD operations, which I still think might make a nice language feature, <laughs> a way to say. You know, this third one is that must be a compile time constant, and I call it n or something. Um, and then you could imagine having conditions on it. But secondly, uh, if we do, I'm still interested in the idea of adding, you know, making Rust have more the ability to do more formal verification and logical predicates and preconditions and so forth, which Absolutely. is a long yeah. road. But if we had that, you could imagine sort of something Might. in that vein fitting what you're saying, Scott. Yeah, my go-to example is like, there's a special distinct lint just for iterator step by to say, don't pass zero. Yeah. And like, if we added a distinct lint for every language, for every library thing that takes a, a primitive type, but doesn't support all the values, then that'd be a mess. It would be real nice if that could be library changes and used by everyone instead of yeah, I agree. making lints for it. Oh, maybe leave but a comment. I, maybe I'll inspire someone. <laughs> and the flip side of that is that it would be nice to have that same partial evaluation, not just to say, oh, can we statically tell that we're going to panic at runtime because you pass zero to step by, but also can we statically tell that you're not passing zero so that we can eliminate that panic? Yes. Obviously, yeah. inline will typically help with that, but it would be nice to have annotations that say, please partially evaluate this to eliminate the panics. Now we're reinventing what Rust used to call type state, <laughs> but it's cool. Sure. Uh, uh, you, can, you can do a pretty good job of that, Josh, with um, just splitting your function in two and having a an inline one on the outside and then the logic on the inside so that the, pan the, the assertions get inlined into the caller. Um, I did, by the way, FCP this, so please check your boxes if you are happy with this lint. Um, one general design thought on the const evaluation there, there's a similar pattern that applies not for constant evaluation, but rather the split function pattern where monomorphization uh, style optimization applies when you have a function that takes a T and the only thing it does with the T is turn it into a fixed type. We kind of want the compiler to do one step of evaluation and then process the rest of the function. The same thing applies here where you could have an annotation that says, I'm going to have some panics right at the start of the function or assertions right at the start of the function. Uh, if we had a precondition panic uh, attribute or similar that says, please evaluate my initial panics at, if you can, that seems appealing. Yes. 
Okay. Uh, shouldn't be doing substantial design in this meeting, but if that's something that excites people, then maybe we can inspire someone to do an uh, MCP to work on those various problems. Let's uh, go on to 84045. This is deny float matches. So this pr proposes to upgrade the warning on float literals in patterns up to deny. And let's pull up the comment here that's been linked from our agenda. I think I just included a link from someone who was, I don't remember which comment I linked to, but there's at least some people who don't like the idea uh, in short, because they know the risks, I guess. Um, I, I've kind of, part of this was also around NAN and other oddnesses. Um, yeah, I, I, I at least when I was trying to when I nominated this didn't uh, come up with a sort of obvious like reason why you know this in particular is dangerous, but other uses of like floats aren't necessarily dangerous. Um, well, I think this was part of our. I think we added this as part of the move that we made to restrict the use of constants in match patterns to constants where sort of they implement partially Q and EQ and they implement them in a way that matches structural equality because we weren't quite sure what semantics we wanted for match. So I'm not actually sure what the compiler does today. I think it compiles, Felix, do you remember? I think it compiles to like an equals, the same thing as equals equals for so. floats, which means NAN never matches even if it's bitwise equal, which is probably, I don't know, it is what it is. <laughs> I, uh, arguably inconsistent with other constants or something, but um, like float does not behave in a nice way. Uh, yeah. Personally, I kind of think that said like floats are just weird in every language and finicky because of the way that they IEEE spec works. I don't know. So what's our long-term plan on this? If we're warning about every possible use, are we trying to deprecate it eventually? It's in future and compat. Like I, I thought this was the set of things where like once we we're have had the infrastructure, like I don't think the future and compat stuff for cargo that the report thing that's meant to table your upstream dependencies having future compatibility issues, that hasn't been stabilized yet, I don't think. I think there's been some recent revival of the effort to do that report future in compat uh, in cargo, but yeah, it's still very much in flight. I, I did not realize that this was in the future compatibility section. I uh, I would well, say I I do think it makes total sense to upgrade this to a deny in that anybody who knows what they're doing is still free to allow it. I'm not sure if we want to be aiming for this to become a hard error, which is what future incompat often implies. I think that the reason it was in that was like future compatibility warning certainly means this may become a hard error, but there was kind of ambiguity about what do we expect? Like I would like to settle the story about constants in generics. And as part of that, settle the fate of this lint. Sorry, constants in match conditions. Um, and I don't, I don't know how, I think that this, I think I have kind of, that was kind of, we were talking about this in the const generics meeting a couple of meetings ago. Uh, like I think it's influenced by const generics. But what yeah. is um what is structural EQ act or what do we even do here for like NANs with different bit patterns and stuff? I believe they're never equal because we compile to partially Q essentially. We could test it. Although my memory is there might be some ways to see the difference if you like I mean the, the 
there's a distinction here between like if it's used as a const that's defined out of line versus inline. I don't know if you're only talking about the case where it's an inline literal. Um, I thought there were some cases where you see the dispatch to the partial eek method and versus where you versus where you see direct comparison. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm sorry, I'm not being clear here. I don't know if it always ends up being partial eek. I'm not sure either. I'm not sure what you mean by C for floats. Is it is that if you have your own partial eek? No, uh, no, I'm not being clear. Sorry. What I meant was that I, there was at least it used to be the case that uh, the the match compilation wouldn't use equals the equals operator in every point, but what would do a structural dispatch? I just can't. And I yeah, I'm not being helpful here. <laughs> I thought there was a case where it might end up doing that here. Um, but I can't recall off the top of my head. I just said the I did a, a, a pretty thorough like evaluation of the different cases that arise, but I'd have to go look it up. So here's a test case. And this outputs A. So I was wrong. Uh, Interesting. Can you tell your test case has your A. Test case. Oh. <laughs> your test oh. case is uh -huh. not exercising. Okay. <laughs> good, good point. It doesn't tell me nothing, does it? I wonder it outputs A. OK, now it outputs B. So. Even if they're bitwise equal, NAN is not equal to NAN. I guess assuming I assuming that LLVM didn't change one of those NANs. Assuming that, yes. I, I feel like this is a stays a warning until there's a plan to know what we actually want here. Like we either need to define really carefully what this does, or it probably see, or it seems to me like it should move for 2024 to be no, you just can't put things that aren't real eek into match anymore. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, kind of how I, I feel too. Stay a warning. Part of it though is, is that like real eek is like, what if like, it, it feels sort of odd that you don't allow equality matching, but you allow like range patterns and you could say you don't allow both, but personally, I, I don't know. So I think the direction we're probably going to wind up going is that pattern matching on constants is just not the same as comparing them with equals and has its own behavior, which is more structural equality, uh, which is more how things are implemented today in many cases. And But I guess I just agree with Scott overall that we should just keep it a warning for now and make a plan. and. Well settle it as part of a bigger picture. But I do want to raise one possibility here. I agree that we should have a plan, but at the same time, we can do conditional branches in that plan and see if both paths agree on the next step, which is to say, it may be that we're not sure whether this should be a future in compat headed toward a hard error or whether it's just a, uh, you probably don't want to do this and you should really know what you're doing. And we may not know which of those two plans we want to go with yet, but if we agree that along either path, we want it to be a, a, an error at this point, whether it's error moving towards hard error or error because we think that it's so unlikely you want this that you should have to opt into it to be able to compile code, then we could go ahead and make this a... Uh, yeah. error denied by default if we think it's true on either path. That's what I was going to say is that actually, uh, I think of this, but it's probably the case that whichever way you go, this behavior is compatible because if it's, it's compatible with the EQ interpretation, because that's how it's implemented. And if you think of unrolling, you still have to define what happens if the leaves, and this is a leaf, and we can kind of say what we want to happen. If that makes sense. Do you know what I mean by unrolling? It's basically like take, if you had a struct constant in there, imagine you changed it into a pattern with the value yeah. of the, um, you still end up at this scenario at the end of the day. So okay. this fires on everything, right? It's not it dependent on what the actual values of the constants are. This splint? Yeah. Yeah, this would apply anytime you do a uh, a float literal in a pattern. 
And is this just um, non-range patterns or range patterns as well? Like, can I just put 1.0 dot dot equals 1.0 and the compiler will shut up? It's a good question. A lot of people brought range patterns in the discussion of this. Um, because Preston. I've been subjected to some linters in other languages that don't like you doing equals on floats, even for zero. And it just sort of results in people doing greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to zero, which didn't improve anything, but it made the linter shut no, up. No, you can't do it in range patterns either. Okay. That's a little more surprising. I would expect, because I would expect range patterns to be a potentially correct way to handle floating point. Well, I don't think the endpoint, I think the problem is the endpoint in predictability in a way, because this works perfectly fine for an integer like two. If you have a float that is exactly two and you match it against two, I assume it will do exactly that. The same as doing equals equals two in an if statement would do, right? Yes. Exact. Yeah, exact interpret like exact floats should not result in problems. Is I was reading some of what I was reading there is like, well, if you do weird literals that aren't exactly a particular float fit pattern, it's not obvious what you're expecting to match on. So part of me says that, you know, there's a lint for if you ever say equals or structural equals to a floating point bit pattern like point 0.1, that's probably not what you wanted. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I it's probably not what you, it may not behave as you want it to, but I think it's sort of unclear. <laughs> yeah. Well, given the discussion here about range patterns, I think that I don't think we should try to FCP this right now, even if we think that we want to do it along either path in that I do think we want to settle the question of which of these things should warn and should some of them not. So I mean, I think my view. Kind of, well, go on. I was just going to suggest uh, maybe we should summarize the open questions that we had to the issue, and in particular, the mention of range patterns and the question of what is the uh, path going uh, forward, whether we're headed toward a hard error or not, and mention that we don't need answers to all of those questions in order to resolve this, but we'd like answers to some of them, and in particular, is the handling of range patterns what we want? Yeah, it, it, it's worth noting that uh, the author of the PR, I, I had already asked about the range patterns question, and they said that, you know, similarly to matching against a constant, matching against a range where the, you know, edges of that range are potentially ill-defined, or, well, not ill-defined, but sort of fuzzy, um, is, you know, in some sense just as bad for some value of bad. It seems like that's just <laughs> at some point you got to compare a float literal to something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I agree with you, Josh. I kind of, after having thought about this a little bit, feel like we probably could settle this sub question without settling the larger constants question. So I would sort of like to do that and stop thinking about it. Um, I don't. That said, the resolution I currently favor is not what this PR proposes. Um, what resolution would are you proposing? Should we I would say about this instead of trying to resolve yeah, this in the triage meeting. I, I was going to volunteer to write it up and not to please say by it. all means. That sounds good. Okay. So, action item Nico to write up a proposal for next steps. In that case, shall we move on to the next item, or is there anything else we need to cover live in this meeting? OK, moving on. Uh, allow unused variables with to do uh, 79850. So a bit of context here. The proposal was to 
make it so that if you wrote to do, then any unused variables in that function wouldn't get warned about on the assumption that they'd be handled by the to do. Uh, I responded to this and Scott seconded the notion that unless there's some kind of warning, then you end up with warning free code when you really shouldn't. And I personally, when I use to do like this, expect to keep getting warnings about uh, unused variables, but uh, it seems worth bringing up for discussion and finding out, do we want to just close this? Do we want to propose that to do itself is something that should produce a warning or not? Personally, I think I want to just close it, but I don't know. That would be my inclination as well, but I'm I, the one who originally said that, so I want to get other opinions. I do feel like there's a problem where Rust code is super annoying in the early days, giving you lots of warnings around, you know, while you're building something up, lots of warnings about dead code and other stuff that you know will get used eventually. I'm not sure that this narrow take on the problem doesn't motivate me especially high, maybe because I never used to do. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, for what it's worth, I, I think in all cases where at least I've been sort of developing code or whatever um, and trying to, you know, do something and maybe I get a lot of warnings, but maybe there's some errors interspersed. The thing that annoys me a lot more is when like I need to scroll up to find the error because I have a wall of warnings and it feels like tackling that is not tackling this. And I would rather, you know, generally speaking, the unused variable warnings are not really annoying me. It's the just wall of errors. <laughs> that's obscured by some warnings. So I would propose that we close this, but suggest a more, you know, if people want to discuss what a more broader solution might look like, that would be fruitful. <laughs> Brainstorm. But. For what it's worth, the that early state of developing Rust, I personally find that to be really satisfying of, uh, here's 20 warnings that tell me what I haven't done yet. Here's 19 warnings that tell me what I haven't done yet. Code till all the warnings are gone. Right. So, Josh, to, to be clear, I agree with you on that point. It's the, here's 20 warnings and an error oh, no. above all of them. <laughs> I wasn't disputing your point, Mark. I was responding to Nico's point of uh, the annoying early prototype stage. And I was thinking that that's kind of the awesome early prototype stage. I do agree I that think... it's easy to lose warnings in a sea of, uh, lose errors in a sea of warnings. That's a different problem. I, I think I agree with both you and Nico, Josh. Um, the like, oh, you have some parents, whatever, I don't care. Whatever happened or to the like expect you haven't thing. used that function yet. Yeah, I know it's fine, but the like, but there's a lot of other warnings that are not that, which I definitely do appreciate. Yes, I definitely don't want to just allow warnings. That's not. But wasn't there? There was an RFC, which I think we accepted to add something like expect, where you would say like I expect a dead code lint here, and then you actually get an error if you don't get a dead code lint. Uh, that's what I usually really want for dead code especially and in a lot of these cases actually i want to say like i know this is wrong it's intentional but i do uh if i accidentally fix it i actually want to know that that's not <laughs> um, i remember that there was a specific proposal for that and i don't well, remember if it got implemented but i would love to have that that's very interesting yeah it's i remember we had a whole joking meta discussion about uh, what happens if you expect unexpected lints and uh, whether there was a girdle <laughs> problem there. Yeah. But yeah, there was a whole memorable discussion there and that would be great. Uh, I think it got, I wanna say we merged it. <laughs> I think we accepted like an RFC for that. I don't remember if the if it was ever implemented. That's what I'm saying. Maybe we can encourage this person to implement that instead. <laughs> and they can put would expect unused variables on their function. Would someone care to take an action item to track down the expect RFC and point people to it? Uh, I can do that. And then uh, I would be happy to uh, FCP close the uh, proposal here and then people can check their boxes. 
Okay. I don't know if they, I doubt the person who proposed this will, they may like expect it doesn't quite solve the ergonomic question. Anyway, it's fine. Let's keep going. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, if you're going to dig up the RFC and point people to it, then that would probably be best uh, placed before the FCP close. So yes. if you want to just FCP close at the end of that message, then uh, that would work as well. Okay. Would you mind doing that? Sure. No, I don't mind. Okay, next up we have the uh, bug casts lint. There were several discussions about this and the last state of this was that we didn't quite have consensus on exactly what we wanted here because it doesn't uh, implement the original solution to the issue. There was still some discussion of, do we want what this is anyway? But there was some back and forth on which pieces we want, which pieces we don't. So that leaves the question of what's our next step here? Can we get consensus on behavior that we do want to lint about? Do we want to send this back to the proposing uh, RFC rather than a uh, pull request? How do we want to handle this? Yeah, I tried to summarize the question. Do we have any um, sort of evidence that this is a problem that comes up in real code. And am I right about the primary concern being portability? Mm, the primary those concern- Those are two independent questions. You, you mean um, with, with the lint or with the problem? With the lint. So you're not talking about whether the problem of uh, accidentally passing the lowercase max function instead of the uppercase max constant? It seemed to me like that problem was not actually solved by this lint in a reliable way. Uh, it didn't work, for example, for u size max, which is something I commonly reference. Uh, so I don't consider it to solve that. It seems to solve a different problem, which is accidentally truncating pointers. Right. And, and I'm which is not sure if that's- Which about and we don't. Right. I mean, that seems like a potential bug that we could warn about. And I guess I wanted to know why, why wouldn't we warn about that? Or why would we? The obvious reason we would is, is potentially a bug. Sort of the reason we would and wouldn't is all portability as far as I can tell. <laughs> right, exactly. So, I mean, the ideal solution to this would involve the mythical portability lint. And I invoke that as mythical because it really would solve a lot of problems. It's also incredibly hard to get right. But the problem and solution is you don't want to cast a pointer to a 32-bit value unless, of course, you've declared that your code will only run on 32-bit platforms. Along the same lines, you don't want to cast it to a 64-bit value unless you know you'll never run on 128-bit platforms but we might want to allow that by default and say you should opt in if you want to run on 128-bit platforms. There's a whole family of warn about the thing you didn't mean to do, but allow it if you meant to do it, that the portability lint solves the general problem. And the question is, is there a subset of that problem that we can agree strongly enough on to be able to enable by default or not? So here's a... Here's a proposal to throw out there. We say, let's do this lint, but remove the, it fixes that original issue because it doesn't fix the uh, issue that last we looked at this, it said it was fixing that. And then we can tune this lint as necessary. I don't know if we want to, you know, put it in as allow and ask for a greater run to see how bad it would be or something like that. Had it had one? Sorry, I didn't look. We disable the lint if it's targeting a 32-bit platform. 
we could. I guess that's not like the, I know the reason we wouldn't want to do that. Okay, it did have a crater, crater but, on. Yeah. I guess it just means 32-bit people will have to turn this to allow this lint in their crater. Well, well or or clarification, 32-bit only people. That's what I mean. People targeting 32-bit only. Right. Yeah, and if you're writing non-portable code for 32 bit, you 32 Right, like there's there's a number of ways that you could do this without allowing the lint to. Right. So it's like you could write it in a more portable way. I do think we try to encourage portability by default, like across operating systems, and I don't know. So I'm, a, I'm okay. There with is one other lint, thing we could but, do that would eliminate this issue. Um, we could add this lint, and as noted, you could allow it if you're on a 32-bit only platform. We could also start working with the uh, libs team on the idea of initial introduction of a truncate function or similar to explicitly say, no, really, I want to truncate this to U32. I know that I'm truncating it, that kind of thing. Uh, that's a good point about eye size. We've been ignoring that completely. We should definitely permit eye size. Um, we, we, we have a whole bunch of annoying rules just to allow you to cast things to eye size about maximum objects. So. Uh, Interesting. Uh, it is reasonable to cast a pointer to eye size if you're going to subtract it. Is it reasonable? in general, if you're not about to subtract it, given that a pointer could validly be above uh, two gig. It didn't lose information. So arguably, yes, you could cast back to a pointer without losing this anything. This is true. This is true. It's no more wrong than U size to I size and then I size back to U size. Okay. Yeah. I'm convinced on that one, yeah. So does anybody object to the proposal of drop the indication that this solves the the original problem, but otherwise go forward with it? If we change the behavior for eye size, I think I could get behind that. Yeah. Um, so the proposal would I, be remove the fixes uh, label. So I, just, I would say uh, Taylor is not currently on the call, and he's the person I would expect to be chiming in right now. So. I don't think we have confirmed consensus since the strongest opponent of this is not present. But Why don't we, we have could, somebody summarize. Uh, yeah. Is this, do we agree? No one wants to warn for ISIS. Or from BS3. Uh, uh oh, what about um, I64 then? Yeah, and I64. Fair. If we assume that the uh, that this is purely a don't lose information thing, then that's accurate. Uh, Mark, you wanted to jump out, jump in. Oh, or, or just wait. It was me, leave. Felix. I was just in the the, the the issue filer. Obviously, said they, they were not obviously the description they listed eye size is something that they wanted to disallow. So for some reason, Ben Striegel was uh, considered you know that domain to be bad. But I don't know why. I might put one more bullet in the proposed meeting consensus of, and we would like a an additional lint, not as part of this PR, that would more aggressively lint on casting function items. Um, What's the, the uh, I, I'm, I'm, that that would be this... a disallow, uh, that that one would be an allow that you have to enable, or that that would specifically apply to functions and not to other truncations? just to function items so that the ah, u32 lowercase max as i don't care what as long as it's not a pointer so i see you'd have to cast so, through fn if you actually wanted the function pointer out of a function item got it makes sense because i think that's where the the complications were arising that if it is actually a pointer and this lint as implemented was applying to all pointers, 
Whereas going from things that are not just any pointer, we can lint far more aggressively. And a lot of these questions about I size and I64 right. don't happen. So I'm trying to understand the suggestion you've made. You wrote it on the, on the ticket as well. You say you want to force people to go through FN. So as in you want them to have to write out the explicit type um, for this thing in terms of the arguments and return type Just as part of the signature, call attention right? to the time. Yeah. Awesome. Point. I think we should sure probably if that final take point the... is consensus or not. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I think that that's a reasonable proposal. And Scott, you should post that. And I wouldn't be surprised if we have consensus. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't. So you should post that and see if we do. But that aside, hopefully we can proceed further on the issue and discuss it there. Um, we are out of time. Uh, as a quick note, I want to call attention to the very last item, 84879, just because it's something we yeah, it's time merged sensitive. and may want to consider unmerging and reverting. So that so was partly my bad there. That one. Did I miss mm -hmm. the... I failed to add a concern before the FCP expired. That said, I think it's also related. If people are going to look at this, take a look at this proposal by Ditolne, which feels to me conceptually related, like putting a, putting this inner attribute in a struct as compared to like a match and other, yeah. you know. All Petra right. Chinkov, who had the proposal that we originally merged that 84879 is proposing to potentially revert, also had a comment on 84414 about whether that is consistent with the general rule there. Yeah, so okay. yeah, there's a general question to be answered there and we should definitely wrap up and give people the time back. So right. thanks everybody.